Welcome to Man About Danville with Logan H. Gurman, a podcast for Danville, Kentucky and beyond. Beyond. Conversations with friends and you get to listen. Brought to you by The Logan Company, a commercial and residential real estate brokerage for Danville and Central Kentucky. 80% Danville-centric, 20% eccentric. Good morning, Danville, Kentucky. You are listening to Danville, Kentucky's favorite podcast, Man About Danville. I am the man about Danville himself, Logan H. Gurman. Thanks for joining me. Whether you are in the car on a commute or a road trip, whether you are headed to the hub or dry stack for a pumpkin spice latte now that fall has arrived, whether you're raking leaves, mowing the yard, on a run at the gym, Maybe you're tailgating for the UK game this weekend. Maybe you're tailgating for a center game. Maybe you're tailgating for a Rhodes College football game. If you're not doing anything, I got something for you. It On Saturday, the 24th of September, you could head out to Wilderness Trail Distillery. The Kiwanis Club is hosting their annual chili cook-off. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. I think they've got 20 or 25 entries making chili. It was awesome last year. I believe the event kicks off at 11 o'clock Saturday morning. It's a ton of fun. Go out, have some chili and enjoy the beautiful weather out at Wilderness Trail Distillery and support the Kiwanis. Whatever you choose to do on this beautiful day, I want you to know that I sincerely appreciate you choosing to spend part of your day with me. And Give this podcast a like or a thumbs up or a review, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or whatever service you use. I re- appreciate the reviews and the ratings. Uh, if you need to email me about the show or about real estate, you can email me, manaboutdanville at gmail.com. You can find me on my website, manaboutdanville.com. You can follow me on Instagram, at Man About Danville. The Twitter handle is at Man Danville. The Facebook uh, location is at Man About Danville. Also, you can find me on YouTube these days. So wherever you choose to access this podcast, I appreciate it. Uh, my guest today is a friend of mine. We've been friends for a number of years. Pleased to be joined today by my friend, Steve Sutherland. Thank you for having me. I'm glad that you finally got through all the cool kids and now you've got... You know, I, I've got at least 20 other people I want. You know, I, I've never talked to Tanner. Yeah. I mean, that, that's on what we're going to get into with Tanner. And right, I'm right. kind of saving him for a rainy day. <laughs> um, there are all kind of people I want to talk to. And this is, you know, back to what I had in, in mind when I started the thing, just me chatting with a friend of mine. All right. So, Steve, first, let's let's get something on the table here. You are a very handsome man, so <laughs> much so that you are sometimes confused on the street for me. Uh, I know when, when we're wandering about downtown, people have come up to me thinking I'm you in the reverse. And let, let, I'm Logan. I am Steve. All right. We're, we're going to. We're two lucky individuals. We are. It, Steve, as handsome as you are, how hard is it to stay humble? It's pretty rough sometimes, but I, I have to endure to, you know, tamp that down. Truly. You, you get by one day at a time. What, what, I tell you what else doesn't help is that you and I are both married to women who are about the same age about the same height, about the same level of slender, about the same color of hair. I didn't realize that until a few weeks ago when we were together and somebody had mistaken your wife for my wife. Right. I was like, they don't look alike, but... But close enough. Close. Yeah. Two beautiful women. Yeah. We are lucky men. We are. We really outkick the coverage, as, as they say. <laughs> All right, Steve, what exactly is your day job? I sell tool and die machinery to industry... In Western Kentucky, that's my territory. And you just got back from a Chicago trade show? Yeah, International Machine Tool Show. Biggest trade show in the world, I think. Five, six days at McCormick Place. It takes up the entire space at McCormick. It's huge. Hundreds of thousands of square feet across multiple floors. Absolutely, yeah. Did you have a good time in Chicago? It was okay, yeah, good time. Chicago's always fun. The, the show was slow Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday were busier. I got to leave Wednesday, so the rest of my cohorts at work stayed a few more days, and I got to bail out of there. You didn't have enough time to go do all the fun stuff outside the show? We had some really good dinners. Yeah, that was nice. There's a, I'm going to take this out later, but there's a place called Sunda that's in Chicago. It's also in Nashville. It's kind of pan-Asian fusion stuff. It's mm-hmm. phenomenal. We, uh, we do a lot of work with uh, a company uh, called Shibura, and they're a Japanese-based machine tool builder. They make humongous machine tools um, in the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollar range. And um, we had a Japanese dinner with those guys one night, and they're always fun to to hang out with. And so you sell machine tool equipment, yet I went to a performance at the Bull County Performing Arts Center 
when the Irish exchange students were here, we went to the Uplift song and dance extravaganza that's put on by Ryan Moffat, who's who's the director of Uplift Performing Arts. Lo and behold, I'm sitting there in the audience, <laughs> and here you come. I was not prepared for Steve Sutherland, the song and dance man. Yeah, that was something way out of my comfort zone. But uh, Sophie had done um, the Uplift camp before, and um, we uh, we asked her about doing it again this year. She said, yeah, sure. And I, I didn't realize they had an adult camp, but um, we were signing her up, and, and they said, we got an adult camp, too. And I was like, you know what? Put me down. If she can do it, I can do it, too. It'll be fun. So you know, it was it was great to be on stage with my daughter, singing, dancing, having a good time. It was, it was pretty awesome. That's outside my comfort zone. You've done a lot of exciting things in your life, but I, that's pretty outside your comfort zone. I, my you have my congratulations on doing something that took some real intestinal fortitude. I didn't know that I could do it. Well, and, and you had a solo, at, le- at least yeah. one in my show and a couple in the mm-hmm. other show. Yeah, a couple in the in the like Friday night, Saturday night shows, and then uh, just one on Sunday. Yeah, I, would, I didn't think I could do that. If I hit the music, do you want to recreate one of the pieces? I'll probably pass. Okay, all yeah. right. I, I, that, I think I would get into copyright infringement, and, and <laughs> no, nobody needs that. When you signed up for the Uplift Performing Arts, did you understand that it was going to be a song and dance program, or, or or what did you think was going on? I thought it was going to be an acting camp, more of, you know, what light before yonder window breaks. Or uh, 12 Angry Men, or uh, yeah. Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, You Can't Handle the Truth kind of thing. You were killed at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't handle this truth. But, but it was song and dance, and I didn't realize that. So Ryan talked you into doing a solo. He did. I I did Footloose, which you know sounds funny, but I I would rather have sung Footloose than learned all the dance moves that everybody behind me learned because it was pretty intense. I, I think I got off easy on that. You know that that really speaks to your age, which is the same as my age. I saw that one in the movie theater. Yeah, I thirteen, fourteen, something like that. Yeah, a, yeah, I knew all the words. <laughs> well, I, that's a fun brave thing to do with your daughter and and I, I know there were other fathers and and children participating i know there was at least one grandfather granddaughter combo yeah what did sophie think about it i think she was impressed you know when we were at uh bull county performing arts center i had uh, come off stage um from the solo where i did billy joel and sophie gave me a high five and she said dad i told everybody that that, that was my dad up there on stage, and I was like, "That is priceless." That, that's that's that yeah. made it all worthwhile. Absolutely, yeah. You sell equip equipment, tools, and and that kind of stuff, but you've got a whole bunch of other things that you experiment with. One of which you were at the Constitution Square Festival this past weekend, selling woodworking products that you made. Yeah, kind of a new endeavor. Tell me about that. So uh, we bought that building on Wilderness Road and spent a couple of years refurbishing it probably it, way too long it's kind of opposite melton's deli there on the corner yeah um up the hill from melton's and in the phases of constructing that building i bought some machinery to mill some wood do some custom stuff and when i got done i had all this equipment and i was like i need to figure out how to do some woodworking and you know kind of see if i could maybe sell some of that stuff make a little side money so i've kind of gotten into that here recently and Done a few commission pieces. So what kind of stuff are you making? um, I made a kitchen island. I got an order for another kitchen island. Some uh, custom, I got to quote a uh, custom reading nook, if you will. Just all kinds of. So uh, you're doing like charcuterie boards and things. Doing charcuterie boards. Which evidently is the thing to be building these days. It must be. We're at the peak of charcuterie in this country. I didn't know that charcuterie could be so popular, but here we are. If you like meat and cheese on a plate... This is this is your time to be alive. Absolutely. So, are you building the whole island with the cabinetry too, or just a just a butcher block top kind of thing? Or it's a butcher block top um, oak structure that's got hand fit dovetails and not really a, an enclosed but an open kitchen island. So, custom built for somebody's kitchen to fit. Yeah. Fit the space allowed. Yep. And the right height to be counter height, so it's different than a table. Yeah. Should be. Uh, Pretty cool piece. The, the last one I did, I was pretty happy with the way it turned out. So this one's going to be a little bit bigger, a little more challenging. But I always learn and grow on these things and 
make a better woodworker of myself. All right. So your wife is my favorite yoga instructor in town. And I, I say that without jest. I, she's a phenomenal. I've never been to another yoga instructor, but, yoga, <laughs> but Francine's <laughs> great at it. And I really enjoy it when I can make time to do it. All that stretching is really good for men of a certain age. Is, is, does she use that building for her studio? Yeah, so the uh, it's kind of the man cave she shed um, concept. The front of it is um, where my woodworking equipment is. The back is where her yoga space is, and then we both have an office upstairs. And it's nice to to be able to hang out with her, and you know she does her thing, I do mine. We get to see each other throughout the day when I'm not out making sales calls. So she, does she teach private class private? sessions with individuals or classes or how does she operate she's got uh some open classes for you know anybody to drop in and then she does yeah private as well and if we wanted to find yoga's francine if we want to find francine's yoga practice where is it uh wilderness yoga shala.com s-h-a-l-a shala shala la 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 yes phenomenal go see her get some yoga you and i met via crossfit i think i was wondering about that I don't know that we didn't maybe meet before that, but I can't remember exactly. You've known my parents for some time. Yeah, when I moved to town, was it 2006, the first place I lived was uh, one of their properties. But I, I don't know whether we ran into each other, but we got to know each other at CrossFit. I'll put it that way. Yeah. And you, you're a stout, pretty stout CrossFitter. Well, I used to be more, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time doth make cowards of us all oh, or man. crummy CrossFit. It's... Anyway, I won't go into that. But yeah. that's where you and I met. You're you're a certified CrossFit instructor. Yeah, level two. L- level two. And what other designations do you have? Um, I did a rowing course. I think that was the only other one I did. Did you not do the CrossFit kettlebell thing? No. CrossFit kind of got weird on their training and outsourced it, and I just didn't didn't go. It's on my bucket list to go get a kettlebell certification, but it's through a different company. My understanding of you is you like obscure... <laughs> athletic uh, equipment and competitions, much like in obscure sports quarterly featured in the movie Dodgeball. You, the more obscure, the more you like it. Let, let's see if I get got this straight. You grew up in Garrett County. Yeah. You were, served in the Air Force. I did four years. Then at another time in your life, you worked as a contractor in Afghanistan. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you too many pointed questions about that. Uh, but, I'd hate to have to kill you. <laughs> I hope it's recording. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that where you became proficient with kettlebells? Yeah, that's where I actually started doing kettlebell stuff. Yeah, it, my uh, Explain the relationship between guys in the middle of nowhere and kettlebells. So um, when you're in the middle of Afghanistan and in some re- remote location, it's kind of hard to, to pack in a lot of equipment and like there were some kettlebell companies in the United States that were great that would ship freight-free kettlebells over to Afghanistan, and that made it really easy to get our hands on those. Um, I'm sure the U.S. Post Office hated that, but uh, it was a good training tool. Um, we did have some plates and stuff, but most of the other stuff we had was Chinese garbage that just didn't hold up too well. But the kettlebells, we could go out in the sand, throw them around, uh, play with them, learn you know how to flip them all that crazy stuff without having to worry about breaking them on concrete like you know you drop a kettlebell at horse country crossfit and see what tanner says <laughs> <laughs> well for for those that don't know a kettlebell is is a ball of cast iron with a handle with a handle on it yeah and if you know what you're doing it's an incredibly versatile piece of equipment absolutely yeah originated in in russia and has become popular in the United States probably since the 80s, I would think. But it's a great tool. I was disappointed when uh, in 2017 CrossFit kind of dropped the kettlebells and picked up the dumbbells and, and didn't use the kettlebells as much since then. Even the programming has been kind of light in kettlebells. If you ask me, we should use them every day. They, they did. In one of those CrossFit games, they switched from kettlebell stuff to dumbbell stuff. I remember when that happened. Yeah, it was 2017. I didn't participate that year because I was recovering from a surgery. There are some things I like dumbbells better for. Sometimes catching the kettlebell in the proper position to not injure your wrist can be challenging for me. You just need to do more of it. (laughs) You're you're willing to work with me on a a private basis to to improve my kettlebell skills? For a fee. I mean, yeah. Or I could go lighter. That, That always helps, too. 
you, you, those are also your maces there in, over there in the corner at CrossFit? Yeah, those are good good tools. I kind of got turned on to them a few years ago. and Just when you were working with the Iron Sheik? <laughs> I, I, I say that. My understanding is he. those are kind of a Persian thing, uh, Iranian thing, and the Iron Sheik used heavy maces a lot in his training. They, they did um, originate over there, and I think um, they had a similar tool in India. It was like a mace, maybe a little bit bigger, but uh, yeah, good shoulder tools, and you could get an overall workout in them. Just uh, I don't, I guess I'm not as fond of them as I am kettlebells. Well, they're just not as portable. It's I think it's a it's yeah. a it's a kettlebell on a stick. <laughs> uh, not maybe not quite as portable. They can be pretty pretty hardcore, but yeah, I take a kettlebell any day. You have applied all of this fitness knowledge to participating in obscure sports around the, the, the southeast, namely your participation in the Highland Games? Yeah, I, I thought I wanted to try something different. Um, That's kind of a running theme with you, Steve. You seem to often try things that are kind of different. I've been blessed with the opportunity to do a lot of different things, and it's been, it's been fun, yeah. Francine says she's got to try to keep up with me sometimes when I'm switching gears and, and try something different, but always keeps life interesting. Well, give us some detail on the Highland Games. Where was it? When was it? What'd you do? I, uh, I wanted to uh, – I was getting ready to turn 50 last year, and I had been interested in Highland Games, and I found out that there was a world-class – coach in Barstown who used to be a, a high-end competitor in uh, Highland Games and I, I went and met him got some private training and um, it was fun and I did a couple of competitions and man I didn't do worth the crap <laughs> I really didn't I was like CrossFit should make this pretty easy and he told me yeah it won't and what it basically came down to was mass, and I didn't have as much of it as the other guys, and that that mass translated into further throws for them, and I just couldn't keep up. That's probably why you never see a skinny shot putter. Yeah. yeah. So, so what specific activities did? So you went to this in Tennessee, is that right? Yeah, I went to uh, one in Tennessee, one out in Western Kentucky somewhere. Yeah, did a couple of them. So you wore a kilt naturally. You have to wear a kilt. It's it's one the main rule in Highland Games is you have to wear a kilt. <laughs> Don't care how far you actually throw the item as long as you're wearing a kilt while you do it. You have to wear a kilt. Yes. All right. So what actual things did you throw and what actual events did you participate in the Highland Games? So uh, they uh, they got the caber, which is the uh, the log throw that everybody associates with Highland Games. Looks like you're throwing a telephone pole. Looks like a telephone how, pole. How tall is it? Uh, they vary in length, and, and your group gets together, and there's like a whole pile of logs there, and you all pick one. And that's the one you all, your whole group, squad, whatever you want to call it, throws. Um, and evidently, you know, skinnier doesn't even make easier. Um, yeah, there's these guys are like, I don't know, this one looks pretty good. Uh, eventually, they pick one, and they're probably 17 feet um, long. And the the trick is to you have to throw it end over end, but it has to land straight in line with your direction of travel when you throw it. So if you throw it and it ends up landing, first you have to toss it end over end first, and then if it's straight, it's a perfect score. But if it's like eleven o'clock, degrade your score a little bit. If it's ten o'clock, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. And it, if you don't flip it, you don't get a score. It's a no rip. I can see flip get, getting one flip in would be really challenging on a seven foot, seventeen foot long pole. You know, it was really tough. You you've got to first get down and get your hands up underneath of it, and then once you do that, you've got to stand up and balance it before you can even start running to try to throw it. It was challenging. Yeah, it. Definitely not something that that I was used to. Any other activities you, other than that one, is is there a like a? Do they have like a kettlebell toss kind of thing over a? Yeah, it's like a kettlebell. It's a weight, like forty pound weight on a chain, and you throw it basically up over your head, and they have a a bar that you have to throw it over, and it starts at like ten feet, and then they keep going up until nobody can throw it over the bar anymore. And these guys were throwing it. 
16, 17 feet, and I'm like struggling to get it over 11 feet. I was like pretty impressed with their abilities. Then they have another one called a, a sheaf toss. It kind of goes back to, you know, when you're in Scotland, they had a little bale of hay and you had to throw it into the barn. So they've got this little burlap sack that's like supposed to be the, the hay. And you've got a pitchfork, and same thing as you throw it over your head over a bar. And there's guys were throwing this thing like 30, 35 feet in the air. And it's like a 16, 20 pound bag of weight. Pretty impressive. But completely specialized. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you're interested, I have a, a she fork that I make a really good deal on. <laughs> you keep it with your maces and your, and your kettlebells and, and your. Uh, Lifting logs and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Those other uh, big heavy things at the box are are mine too. They, yeah, yeah. They belong to a friend of yours. Uh, they're they did belong to a friend of mine. You have any plans for anything else obscure fitness related? So uh, it seems like twice a year I do these ruck and shoot things that are pretty fun. Anywhere from four or five miles to eight or nine miles, you uh, ruck over uneven terrain, stop along the way and shoot uh, pistol and rifle stages at varying lengths. And you, and you camp out overnight in these activities? Well, Tanner and I used to do some of those, and um, that kind of got a little bit too much for me. It was two, three-day event where you would leave. You have to take over everything with you, your food, all your ammo, any gear you needed. And that could be like 26 miles of rucking over three days, and that was pretty long-range shooting stuff. The ones I'm doing now are they're called run and gun, um, and it's just pistol and rifle. Finish it up in you know three or four hours and call it a day. Are these local? Are they in the state or neighboring states? Or um, yeah, one of them is in Wilmore at Bluegrass Sportsman's League, and then the other one that I've been doing is up at uh, Elk Creek, um, where they do uh, they have a winery and clay pigeons. They let these guys go in there and shoot ARs and pistols around all over the place once a year. You're also training for the Bourbon Chase. Yeah, less than two weeks away. <sighs> when when exactly is the Bourbon Chase? Uh, the 30th of September and the 1st of October. Thirty. That's that's a weekend, obviously. Yeah, it's not this coming Friday, but the next. <laughs> you really are into some obscure fitness. Did you realize? I, I didn't realize you were into this many obscure fitness activities. Well, I don't know if I'd call the Bourbon Chase obscure, but I do. Do you run it. in the middle of the night in the darkness? Yeah. <laughs> Explain what the bourbon chase is for somebody that doesn't know. So the bourbon chase is a, uh, I think it's 200 miles, broken up into legs for 12 people. So each person has three legs, and um, there's two vans. Each van has six people in it. So when the first van's out riding around, picking up rider runners and dropping them off, the second van's resting, and then they flip, and the first van rests while the second van people run. And um, the legs all vary in length, but my first leg is nine miles. Ooh. Yeah. And then I've got two that are right around three miles after that. Um, So I run at like 8.30 in the morning, 9 o'clock at night, and then somewhere around 8 in the morning the next day. And then it finishes in downtown Lexington. Runs all over central Kentucky, though. Do y'all run between distilleries? Yeah. Yeah. And... uh if the if history remains constant, they will be running through Danville the evening of the thirtieth. That's a Friday. Yeah, I did it. Uh, what was it? Two thousand fifteen. I did it before. There's a huge energy in Danville. Um, they really support the Bourbon Chase, and it's pretty fun to be in town, even running, just watching whatever to uh, to come and participate. If you think you're going to have dinner downtown on Friday the 30th, don't plan on it. I would but, think that, yeah. But come down and cheer the runners on. It's a, it's really cool. To see. And these people, when they get finished with a leg, they're really happy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fun. You know, the, the biggest thing about it is uh, the camaraderie, um, just being with your friends for 24 hours and running around and laughing and joking. That's really what makes the Bourbon Chase fun. And, and people come from all over the country to do this thing. They do, yeah. And it's I guess the Bourbon Chase has been – taken over by Ragnar um, and it's part of their Ragnar series of extreme distance runnings. Th- those are the guys that do the obstacle courses and those kind of things, right? I think they just do long runs. Long trail run kind of things? Yeah. Have you done one of those? 
No, I don't really have any interest either. Have you done a obstacle course race? Yeah, I quit sure doing you those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you have. I have. You know, I I did a oh a tough mutter uh uh-huh. in like 2014, and it was 40 degrees. It was like six hours out on this course. It was the nastiest, slickest mud I've ever seen in my life. And um, there were, like, all kinds of people along the course that had sprained ankles and stuff. And I was like, the the risk versus reward on this just isn't there. And I just don't have any interest in doing those type of obstacle course races anymore. But Bourbon Chase is all on road. It's all on paved roads and their support vehicles. And Yeah. Different. I, I gotta think I have to run across Bardstown. Through Stanford and and then one other one other place I don't remember where it is. Stanford usually has a pretty good atmosphere as the runners come through. And and actually I don't know what Danville I'm I'm out of the loop. I don't know what Danville has planned for that Friday night. Do you? I don't know either. I I know all of the runners um, tend to congregate here and have dinner. And downtown should be pretty busy. In, in years past, they've closed closed off a couple of blocks of Main Street and yeah. Had food trucks and all the restaurants stay open and yeah. When we had the restaurant um, down in Fourth Street, it was packed on Bourbon Chase night. All that running makes you hungry. I guess so. Yeah. And so when you're not doing obscure fitness activities, you're a sommelier <laughs> or training to be a sommelier. <laughs> Is that right? Am I, am I even saying that word properly? Yeah, that'll that'll do. How do you say it? Sommelier. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I, Francine and I watched this. Uh, a documentary called Some, and it's about these guys who were studying and preparing to take their Master Somalia course. I was like, man, it must be cool to be able to enjoy wine at that level, and just kind of went on about my business. And then a couple years later, I don't know, I I saw an ad or something for Somalia course, and it was in Tampa, and Francine's best friend lives down there, and I thought, hey, this could be pretty good. I could go take this Somalia course, and... uh, you can go hang out with your friend for the weekend and both get something out of it. So that was in April of 2019. I took that and definitely uh, opened up my appreciation of wine. Um, I had drank wine before, but didn't know much about it. So the plan was there to actually, they call that the introductory course, and then to actually become a certified sommelier, you have to take a test. It's three-way test it's written verbal and practical and i had scheduled to take a deductive tasting workshop in may of 2020 and everything shut down the quartermaster sommeliers in america took a long time to get back up and running i was hoping to test in june of that year and it didn't happen obviously and they're just now i guess earlier this year like June started opening up in-person courses across the U.S. And I'd love to go drop in, take the deductive tasting workshop, and eventually get certified. But I'm not sure at this point if I will. But definitely open up my eyes to uh, wine and how to appreciate it, what to get. You know, it's always like a toss of the dice when you go to the liquor store and, or go to a restaurant and get a glass of wine. You're like, I don't know if I'm going to like this or not. You get disappointed. But there's so much to know about wine and what what different types taste a different way. And now I, you know, kind of silly, but I could go buy a bottle of wine and, and know what to expect, you know, know what I'm going to taste. And know what you want to serve with it as far as food goes or vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you started the process, but you never, you haven't been able to finish you're not a certified some some sommelier. Yeah, I've I've got the introductory. So that, that was a two day, pretty intensive workshop in learning history um, and theory of wine, tasting a bunch of wine, and then there was a test at the end. Passed it. Yeah, I'm kind of in limbo right now. Are there, is there anyone else with that certification in Danville? I'm not sure. Uh, they're, they're, Danville's such a funny place. It's entirely possible that there is somewhere, <laughs> and we just don't, if you are. Give me a call at manaboutdanville at gmail.com. Uh, I'd like to get together. I'd like, to, like, like to have a tasting that we could record into a podcast. Uh, <laughs> well, I think you should finish that up, Steve. That way you'd be one of the few people in America, I assume, that would be a CrossFit Level 2 instructor and a sommelier. There's probably not a whole lot of those out there. It's, it's a weird cross combination of, of skill sets. but I need to finish that. 
As soon as they uh, they open the schedule up a little bit more, maybe I can find a deductive tasting workshop and get on the ball with it. There's been oof, a couple of years have passed now. Well, yeah, I have so to restudy if, after having taken the class that long ago. You, it, it's you would be a little bit rusty, but yeah. All right, what else are you into? What other topics have we not covered? Hmm. Anything else other than your run for city commissioner? <laughs> Since you brought that up. <laughs> Hang on. I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Because I don't want every Yahoo calling me wanting to. <laughs> All right, Steve, when I started this podcast, I was going to have conversations with my friends. And that's that's what we're engaged in here. How And I said I was never going to do political topics because I don't want to get into it. My politics are mine, and you don't need to know about them, and vice versa. But I would be remiss in not pointing out that you are, in fact, running for Danville City Commission this fall. I am. How did you come to this decision? It it was a tough one. A lot of thought went into that. Um, but uh, I really um, I love Danville. And I think we've got a great community here, and I'd just like to uh, offer up myself uh, as a servant to the people of this town um, to, uh, to serve on a commission. What other questions do you want me to ask you with regard to that? You don't have to. But no. Because no. I know you didn't want to go political. Yeah, but we've done it now. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to open the floodgates for you. Well, just what, what would be? I got one. Okay. What would you like to accomplish as a city commissioner? Um, I would like to uh, to definitely do some work with economic development. I think that we uh, we really need to bring in some industry uh, in this town, and um, we also need housing desperately um, as you know as a realtor um, there's not enough houses for people here and really you have to put one before the other because you've got to have houses for people to live to be able to have economic development but then you have to have economic development for people to need the houses it's kind of a delicate balance but really um, I think that the EDA, the EDP, uh, and whatever other groups need to come together uh, and really put our foot forward for Devil and promote it and see if we can't at least get some offshoot business from this these two battery plants that are now going into E-Town. It's going to be huge for Central Kentucky. You know, it's an hour and a half away, and I'm sure that there's going to be some people that are going to be looking to settle in Central Kentucky to help facilitate these battery plants and i don't know why we couldn't end up with some of that just like the toyota plant has what has it done it's generated a bunch of other jobs and businesses not just in georgetown scott county there's a ton of yeah um factories and support facilities around central kentucky that just you know do work for toyota um when i had a tool and die shop we didn't do work for toyota per se but we did work for secondary suppliers and did a lot of that um so yeah there's no doubt in my mind that there's going to be other industries or other businesses looking to settle into central Kentucky for these battery plants. So, so even if Danville doesn't have its own battery plant, I, I think with these other things coming to the state, state, I agree with you that there's going to be a lot of opportunity for high wage, low density businesses that could really be a real boon to the, to the, Absolutely. To the city. Yeah. But that's just me talking. There's, you know, there's been such a decline in industry in Danville. Um, we need, we need some jobs, really do. Of course, you know, there's also the training aspect of it too. Um, we've got to train our workforce to be able to do these jobs. And I, you know, I think we're positioned for that too with BCTC out there. I think that, that they're well positioned to train. 
people for these kind of gigs? They are. Their enrollment is surprisingly down from what I understand. Um, and there needs to be a pathway from the high schools right to their doorstep. I mean, when these kids are in their sophomore, junior year, they need to be looking at BCTC because not everybody's going to college. And if you've got a good career path that is a trades-related work, it's going to be just as good as having a college degree. You're you, going to live well off you, of it. You can have a very comfortable, secure life. Absolutely. Th- that is – that shouldn't be – you can have a very happy, secure life. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And from what I understand, maybe there's there's just not a lot of kids going to BCTC right now and, and learning – trades related jobs but you really need to i mean it's be a good career path anything else related to your campaign having a meet and greet uh thursday night at copper and oaks second floor this will this will release the day after (laughs) oh shit sorry (laughs) this is this will release friday Steve, if, if folks want to meet you and learn more about your campaign for city commissioner, I'm guessing you're going to be out and about all over the place yeah. between now and Election Day. And there's a debate uh, going to be at Norton Center on the uh, 25th of October, I believe, for all uh, commissioner candidates and mayoral candidates. You can put your uplift performing arts skills to use on stage at the Norton <laughs> Center, Steve. <laughs> Maybe oh. I could do a little song and dance. It comes full circle. Do you think that that might get me some more votes? I think it would. Good. I, I, th- I, I think I Dancing with the Danville that. Stars uh, and Uplift Performing Arts is going to segue very nicely into your political career. <laughs> uh, but you will be at the Chili Cook-Off this weekend out with the Kiwanis at Wilderness Trail. And I, I bet you're – if you see someone that looks like me but it's not me and you want to talk to them about their <laughs> – Absolutely. I I look forward to uh, to seeing what uh, concoctions they've created out there. It should be pretty good, and the weather's going to be great. Oh, it should be great. I I judged at the chili cook-off last year, and it was – I mean, there's some people – there are one or two dogs, but, man, for the most part, there are some really good cooks out there. So it was – I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to it. All right, Steve, that's all my time. I appreciate you being with me. Hey, I appreciate you having me. Once again, my thanks to my friend Steve Sutherland for joining me on today's program. That's all I've got for this week. Reach out to me on my social media. Give these episodes a share. I appreciate that. Head out to Wilderness Trace this weekend. See my friends, the Kiwanis, and get some great chili at their big annual chili cook-off. Until next time, be well, have a good weekend, and thanks for listening. That's it. We're out. Thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. Subscribe to Man About Danville wherever you access your favorite podcast. And be sure to tell your friends about us. You've been listening to Man About Danville with Logan H. German, brought to you by The Logan Company, a commercial and residential real estate brokerage for Danville and Central Kentucky. Know someone who would be a good guest? Want to be a guest yourself? Have an idea for the show? Get in touch with us. Find all our contact information on the web at manaboutdanville.com. Thanks for joining us.